We wanted to start exactly at 9 o'clock. Sorry we're late. My name is Ralph Kittleson. I'm director of the Grain Department. Last year, I'm sure some of you attended our seminars and uh, were at the convention. And this is going to be a uh, sort of a rerun with some updated material. And it's the program that we're going out again this year. There's a still a lot of people who have not had the education and the understanding of what it takes to make collective bargaining work and what it takes to build a power base to get where we want to go. Vance has been putting in many long hours with the seminar material this year. He's trained people again. And uh, this year, Ray Jurgensen from uh, Montana will be helping with these sessions. And uh, they'll give you the instructions as we go along uh, the sign-up tables after. We're going to set them up by regions. And uh, I hope we have a good day, and i sure pleased to see you here this morning. So I'm going to just turn this over to Vance right away. Vance Combs. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a year since I stood before this group and talked to you. A year ago, we launched our educational program. We'd had three trials in South Dakota and North Dakota before we came here before you at the convention. And we had one of the great successes of the history, in the history of the grain department at the National Convention a year ago. I wish to thank all of you who participated in that program at that time. And I told you at that time that this was not a one-shot deal, that if we were going to offset the illusions that had been presented to us over the years that kept us from putting together a marketing system of our own, whereby we could achieve the cost of production plus a reasonable profit and not one damn penny more or less, that fear and greed had to leave us as driving forces, that we had to become business people, and we had to conduct ourselves as business people. We have been extremely successful in some areas. In some areas, we have been unsuccessful. But you cannot turn a trend that has come down through the ages in agriculture, you cannot turn the weight and the velocity of that type of thinking in one short period of time. Don't expect to. Education, as we told you last year, is a progressive, progressive effort. How many times were you taught U.S. history? And we don't yet know it yet. We continually, we continually must apply ourselves to learning more about our situation. So today, we're going to cover, we're going to give you a little population, a little energy as it applied to it. But remember when we're talking about this, that this is not a study of population growth, migration, changes in eating habits, and so forth, as related to the grain supply of the world. It is not that kind of an educational program. We apply that to this educational program only as a side effort to show you where you are in the world today and how necessary and important you really are as the producers of the most vital vital form of energy on earth, grain producers, and I must say it again to you, are the most important people, most important people on the face of the earth because you, you generate each year a form of energy that sustains all flesh. Not an engine, but sustains all flesh. And that's what you are, folks. I'm going to talk to you some about population. You put something up there. Can you see that? I, I tried hard. Take that one. 
We have here the top 25 cities in 1925. Study them a moment and see where they are. This indicates to you the migration of population and the development of nations in the other hemisphere that are coming down on us hard and fast. I think there's something like 11 cities that were in the top 25 in 1925 that don't appear in 1980. They've been replaced by other cities. People who do not produce a great deal of agriculture commodity. And they're growing at an enormous rate. Take a look at Mexico City right here in our southern, in our, on our southern borders. It's absolutely phenomenal. These are people every, every week. Every five days, there's another million people on the face of this earth. About every three years, you have enough more people to, to populate another United States. And remember, these people have to be fed, clothed, housed, educated to some degree, and they have to be employed in some manner. The strain upon the supply of grain on this earth is horrendous. And we're going to get into some of that in a moment. We talk about, well, look at all the extra land we have that we can put into production. Flicker. Here is a, not a very good picture, but it was the best thing I could come up with of the two hemispheres, and I've shaded out approximately the major grain growing areas in that hemisphere. Most of the southern hemisphere lies under water in a temperate zone. And it's in the temperate zone that most of the grain is produced. The northern hemisphere in the case of Russia, for instance, Russia under Khrushchev brought in the specialists and tried to increase his production. And he tried to increase by increasing acres. So he went into marginal areas, extremely marginal areas, far more marginal than we have here in the United States. And he tried to increase that production. What happened? They have a fluctuation of almost 100% every year one way to the other in their extremes. Once in a while, they'll get the 230 million bush, uh, tons, metric tons that they anticipate. It's usually down around 180, 170, sometimes to 150 million metric tons. China, I guess, is the largest producer of grain on Earth. You just heard about the United States government making a deal with China to supplement their food. They have a billion people in China now, you know. They, they, they achieved that goal last year sometime. And there's quite a few mouths to feed. And from the pictures I see, I haven't been fortunate enough to get over there, but our national president has. And from the picture I see of these people, they're fairly well fed. They better be because you turn a billion hungry people loose on a government and it won't stand long. But I, I prepared this for you to show you that the next time somebody said, oh, there's lots of land, don't worry, we can do this, we can do that. Don't believe it. There's the picture. There's another factor in this. I'm reading more about it every day. And I'm looking at statistics and production of grain, and I find that we've leveled off, especially in feed grain. In the last three years, four years, we have not been able to increase our production. The increase that we have received and our bins has been through increased acres, not through increased production per acre. We are achieving a level of, of production that's going to level off, and we're going to have to get into much deeper research, much more complicated research, to get another spurt out of production through efficiency and through scientific research. We're going to get into microbiology, and this is very deep. 
and it's very hard to handle, and only God knows what the result will be in the way of resistance to pests and drought and so forth, disease of these new plants and these new animals are coming up with, with multiple births and such as that. So it's not going to be easy. We have an extreme pressure upon ourselves. I look to see the United States government become more and more and more involved in the grain business from a diplomatic standpoint. They, last year, have become very involved when they put on the embargo and brought back 17 million metric ton of grain that was destined for Russia, brought it back into our inventories. And we put up with that grain moving into the market on occasion throughout the entire spring and summer. And it did affect us. It had a, a depressing effect upon us all the way along. So we'll be talking to you about the effect of embargoes upon us and how we must learn to cope with them. I'm going to talk to you now about uh, inventories. Oh, wait a minute. I have something. Yeah. Is that what I want? All right. I'm going to give you some statistics on feed grain. I can't. Uh, I bought a new pointer the other day. I got to use it. <laughs> These are all feed grains. This is number five. I want number one. Did I? I'm usually out of order. When you get to be my age, things break down more often. <laughs> well, that's number one is, uh... <laughs> Must have another old goat out there someplace. <laughs> number one is corn. That's number one is corn. And this is the one that you people are most interested in, corn and beans, right? Okay, let's take a look at our end stocks. 884 million bushels in 1977, a billion 104, 1978, a billion 2857.7, is it, and 79, and a billion 700 million and 80. But this year, when they came out with the first projection, on 910 of this year, they came up with 983. About a month later, it had dropped to 704 million. And a short time after that, it's down to 544 million bushels on the carryover come next October 1. That's the lowest carryover we've had in corn in recent history and the largest demand. Your crop of... of uh, Corn last year, 1980, 79-80, <clears throat> was equal, almost equal to the entire production of all four major feed grains in the United States this year. Let's take another look. I think it's number two. Is I want to get into this because The point I wish to make here and now is that a lot of our people, most grain producers, when they see a short supply, they assume that the market is going to rise, and it does. But there's another factor involved, another economic and political factor involved that we haven't had to put up with except in the recent years. And we must learn to cope with it and take a look at the situation and anticipate when it's most likely to reoccur to us. The last three presidents that we have had have used the embargo. And for different reasons. And here we sit with the lowest supply of feed grain in our history in the world. And this, not, this applies to the entire world also, incidentally. And I can't see anything on the horizon except 
another embargo or some form of pseudo embargo like contract reviews, things that we uh, ran into under uh, what, what the president, what's his name? This has a very depressing effect upon that market. How it happened to you on the fourth day of January, 1980? Markets are going along pretty good, weren't they? Had a good moving of grain into the world supply. All of a sudden, boom, you wind up with 17 million metric ton back into your inventory. I see people holding corn today for a higher price, a higher price, a higher price. You better feed that market. Because if that doesn't come into the market, you're going to short it. And once you shorted it, you're going to be looking at embargo, some form of embargo, some form of hindrance in the movement of grain. And when that backs up into your lap, you're the person who is the lowest on the ladder with the least pressure upward in that market. And when pressures come on, they seek the weakest point. And we as producers of agriculture commodities are the weakest point. That's why I'm showing you these inventories. Even the wheat that we produced this year is no great thing. We got the biggest production of wheat in our entire history. Something like, what, 2.3 billion? Do you know that we moved right up with the exports and absorbed all of it? And our carryover is less than it was last year, right? It's about the same. 900 and, nine, 910 million bushels. But in years 1977, when we were getting much less wheat for production, we had a larger carryover. The world needs grain, and the world is buying grain. We hear a lot about, uh, I want to get into that. Uh, yeah, let's show them who produces the most. This gives you a little idea of where wheat comes from. I want to see that European community. We hear a lot of rumor about what happens to our grain when it gets to the threshold of certain European communities and nations, and what happens to the threshold when it enters or crosses the threshold of Japan. And they have been rumors because we haven't seen a study. But here's a study, a figures from a study, and I'm passing out the entire study in our seminars this year as part of the portfolio. And here is a set of figures showing the penalty or the assessment whenever the grain crosses the threshold of these European community nations. And you'll notice that over in the left-hand column, pardon me for turning my back on you, but it looks best. You'll notice that we run about 60% increase in price when that grain crossed the threshold in 1970. And you will notice as the prices went up, as you go across that page and all those various types of grain going into the various countries, the four major countries in the European community. You'll notice as our prices went up through 72, 3, and 4, and then declined in 75, down and down, that the amount that they penalized our grain on the entry into that country was directly related to the price that we were getting for our grain. And until it reached a parity basis, and we were getting a full profit in 1974, 73, grain we raised in 73, but reached the European market in 74, you'll notice that we had come up with zeros and even minus ones. And yet we're told that if we price our grain, that those people won't buy it. 
We have another graph here, that we're, our, a group of statistics in a moment, that'll show you that very little difference in the purchases, very little difference in the purchases in that same time period. And you'll notice that over on the right-hand side, that some nations are penalizing us up to 150 percent. Money that you're le leaving on the table because you don't price your commodity. It's no longer rumor. Here is a research that's been put out by the, National, the, uh, the, the Department of Agriculture that, that absolutely substantiates the rumor. And it shows and proves to me, and should prove to you, that as long as we stay on a parity basis and not go above it, that we have no fears. There's nothing wrong with getting a fair price for a commodity. And I've written that it's a sin. It's a sin to put that essential form of energy on the market for less than its cost of production plus a fair profit. This shows you the sales. The bottom line, the top line, is, are the imports from us. The bottom line are, is the interrelationship trading between the four nations or the European common market nations. They have very few trade barriers because they've become like us as states as far as agricultural commodities are concerned. And they don't charge one another going across the portal. But however, they do charge us. And you see that in the years 1974, 73, 74, and 75, when they were penalizing the least, they did not appreciably back off in their purchases of grain from us, which kills that theory pretty dead or shakes the foundation of that theory. So the next time somebody tells you that if you ask a fair price for your grain, you can't sell it, you tell them, um, I got a whole, a whole truck driver vocabulary for that one, but I won't put it on you. <laughs> now what am I going to do? Soybeans? Would you like to see the soybean production? I didn't get but three years on this. There again, we have the lowest carryover we've had in recent years. Inventories are fragile. Now I'm going to talk to you about the four things that are essential to a balanced business. And this is really why you came, or really why I came. I'm going to talk to you about the four things that are necessary to structure a successful business. And they can't come one after the other. It's like baking a cake. They all got to be there at the same time or you won't have a cake. Some things are progressive, but not the structure of a business. One is management, good management. And there's not a one of you sitting out here that have survived in agriculture today can be said that can be said about you that you are poor managers because of your worry to have been long gone under the stress that you've operated under. The second one is you've got to have sufficient capital. I know you haven't had all you wanted, but you've had enough to survive or you wouldn't be here. <coughs> The third thing is the ability to acquire what you need, a procurement system, a system that will give you the things and the supplies that you need for inputs into your manufacturing business, as you, if you will, a manufacturing of food, anytime, any place you need it. And it must be in abundance, or you can't operate your business. And the third thing is that you, fourth thing that you must have is a sales organization, a sales structure, a sale for profit, a marketing capability where you can take the results of the inputs of the procurement department 
manage it, finance it, balance the growth and their, your money and, your, and, your, and your, you then go into the market with it on the basis of a pricing structure that reflects to you a profit so that you can recover your capital and maintain your growth and a healthy operation. Put up that schematic, will you? No. <clears throat> Cover that mess. A top line is a crude schematic showing you thousands of producers of agricultural commodities, grain in this instance, moving into a procurement system, a transfer of the title of the commodity from you, the producer, to the grain traders through their procurement system that totally and completely dominates that transfer. The transfer of title from you to your buyer. Once arriving there, they get a little influence and interplay from the speculators that trade paper every morning. But on the whole, it moves now into a grain user's Directly? No. It comes in through their procurement system and their sales system. The grain traders have a sales system. And from there it moves into the procurement system of the grain user. And out of that procurement system it goes into the grain user's handles. And it goes on and on into the hands. And it goes on and on through that procedure. Mechanic. All right, that fix it. I wrapped the thing. You got a switch on this. On and on through this established structure and through this type of schematic. The thing that we are without is that sales system. There has never been developed for the producers of agriculture a marketing and sales system. And uh, somebody says, all right, yeah, we got this, we got that, we got the other. Yes, but for what purpose? Was that put together for the purpose of both parties making a profit? If it was, why isn't it doing it? You do not, if you have something that you think is that, you have, and it doesn't perform in that manner, then you don't have a sales system. A sales system is a structure for the purpose of you transferring the title of your commodity to someone else's procurement system for the purpose of both parties making a profit. That's a capitalistic system. And what you in agriculture have is a four-leg table with three legs under it. And the damn thing keeps falling over and you wonder why. You do not have a sales system. This is what your system ought to look like, the schematic. Cover that top one. I don't want to see that garbage anymore. <laughs> there is the picture of a balanced business, a balanced business that once you get into a profit situation and you're satisfied with that and you don't shoot at the moon and you don't try to gouge somebody for $10 for a $5 bushel of grain, now you got a business going, right? And this is what the National Farmers Organization is all about. All in heaven's name we're trying to do is build you and get you to participate in a marketing system and fill that schematic and balance that schematic and take away from the complete dominance of that transfer, take away the complete dominance of that transfer by the grain Traders grain procurement system that I harped on to you last year. That schematic is a balanced business. Doesn't that look nicer than the other one? This four-leg table you have, you keep 
sticking pillars of salt under that corner without a leg, and the salt keeps melting, and the table keeps falling over, and you keep going bankrupt, and you keep going to the cities where there's already too many hungry people. Just because somebody told you, you don't need a sales system, all you need to do is become more efficient. And if good Lord, if efficiency had done the job, you'd all be multimillionaires. There's no one in the world that can put as little in the ground and get as much out as you can. You're the most efficient people in the world. You're the smartest people in the world in your field in your field, but they have kept you in a state of complete stupidity when it comes to marketing. And they've maintained it. And you have apparently liked it because you keep going back to that same poison trough for your next drink. This is what the National Farmers Organization is all about. No more, no less. We have been ridiculed. We have been slammed up against the wall. People have tried to circumvent us. Our own members have tried to circumvent us and go off on the tangents when the only thing you have to do is bite the bullet and build for yourself or learn to use a system that has been developed for you by your organization whereby you can market your commodity for a reasonable profit. And I want to reiterate, not one penny more. We're going to show you, you're going to do that this afternoon in this section too. We're going to show you a, a picture of the actual cycles of boom and bust in agriculture, where you're motivated by fear when you're getting less in your cost and occasionally, when you get more than your cost, you're motivated by greed and the two most destructive forces in the human race. Sir, I would ask you to hold your questions until we ask for them. We're trying to maintain uh, a classroom configuration here. Thank you. How long have I been going? What else have I got to do? Okay, we're going to get into systems a little bit. Last year I talked a great deal about the grain trader grain procurement system, what it had to do, how it did it, and when did it fail, and so forth. A procurement system, and I didn't spend enough time on the fact that there's nothing wrong with it because it's necessary in every balanced business, and that's why I started off today naming the four things that are essential in establishing a successful business capital, management, procurement capability, and marketing for profit. Those four things have to be there. So it applies to us also. We have to have a procurement system. Any procurement system functions pretty well if there is a marketing system to supply it. But it has great difficulty if there is no marketing system because there's no structure whereby they can go to the negotiating table or go into the market and buy at any particular time. When you don't have a marketing system, the producers of that commodity or the holders of that commodity have the characteristic of withdrawing from the market every time they get in a cash position or they'll stay out of the market for at any length of time that they think they can stay out if they think they're going to get a little more money because you see you have no, no structure, no system for doing this. And if we look at the movement of grain in the United States today, we find that we're moving perhaps close to six billion bushel offshore and our logistical capability it has to operate at about 102 percent. At 5.6 billion, we figured it out, it has to operate at 250 working days a year. Our logistical system has to operate at 94 percent efficient because the most we've ever moved uh, uh, loaded in one week is 119 million bushel. And if you put the figure to that, when you get to 5.6 billion, that means that you've got to load more than a and I, then a hundred million a week 
and to export spouts to keep up with the demand that you have in the world market. There's no, no place for slippage. So the procurement system has to furnish to the trader an abundant supply any place, any time they need it. The three points, abundance, time, and place. We have to have the same thing as producers of agriculture commodities. We've got to have fertilizer, we've got to have machinery, we've got to have parts. We've got to have all of the things, all the inputs that we put into our business. We have to have it in abundance, any place, any time we need it. But in the absence of a marketing system, then that must dominate. It must force that grain or that commodity to that buyer whenever he needs it because he has no way of negotiating for it. There's no system he can negotiate with. So I'm going to talk to you about the grain trader grain procurement system a little bit and the handicap that it has and the difficulty it has. I know we all get angry. We get angry over the big companies. I want to tell you something here and now. You have increased your exports from $2 billion to $5.6 billion last year, and it's going to exceed that substantially this year in a matter of 10 years. Now, I want to ask you, how could you have done that if you hadn't had the Cargills and the McMillans and the Freebergs, the Continentals, and the Bungies and the Louis Dreyfuses? with their international marketing system, marketing system for the purpose of making them a profit. Throughout the world, they have built this. They have their ships. They have their internal uh, 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 elevators, their fast loading facilities, their unit trains, their port facilities, their ships, their barges. And I, we have people who propose that we circumvent them. How many billions of dollars do you suppose it would take to build a logistical system parallel to them and isolate them and destroy them? You can't do it. They are the customer. We are not enemies. We are adversaries, as we should be. Because this whole civilization is built upon an adversary attitude. And when it becomes enemies, we begin to kill each other and try to destroy each other. And that's not the name of the game. We are adversaries. Our whole entire legal system is an adversary system. And that's what we live in, and that's what we should build ourselves into. I cannot go by without saying something for the majors. We leave them in quite a bind. We're unpredictable. We're unorganized. And we have a tendencies to operate kind of like a mob when it comes to marketing our commodity. And here they sit with commitments throughout the world that they got to fill. And they're depending upon our instability to furnish that commodity to them. So they built this very, very simple procurement system that dominates the entire scene between ourselves and them. And it does those three things. It furnishes an abundance any place, any time they need it. How does it do it? It does it with low prices. As long as they maintain a price level that reflects something to you less than your cost, on the average, what does it encourage and stimulate you to do? Some of you have heard this before. What does it encourage you to do? Become more efficient? Got to get more production out of a unit. So that takes care of the abundance, doesn't it? I just told you you'd increased your production where you could export into the world from $2 billion up to $5.6 and almost $6 billion this year. It stimulated you to produce more and more and more, trying to catch your tail with production, but always receiving on an average of something less than your cost. 
that. What does it force you to do? What does the fact that you're receiving something less than your cost force you to do with this abundance every year? Sometime in that time frame, you're going to lose title to that commodity, aren't you? You're going to have to change it for cash to pay your bills. So that takes care of the time and place, doesn't it? So this very simple little fact that they're going to continue to pay you something less than your cost makes their system work. But the minute, when does it fail? The minute that it puts you in an equity position, the minute that, it, that you're getting and you only have to sell half of your grain or two-thirds of your grain or three-fourths of your grain every year, you remember it's storable, to pay your bills and keep your growth going, then you don't take that other bit to market, do you? Well, how can the grain trader supply the world with three-fourths of your grain coming to the market every year? He has to force it out of you because you have no marketing system where you can sit down and say, yes, I'm contractable for every cockeyed kernel I've got on the basis of my cost plus a fair profit. That's what you have to do. But do you know what I hear from you? I don't want to do that. I was before a group here not too long ago, up north. And I, the, the question was posed. I didn't pose it. One of our staff people did. If six dollar, if you could get six dollars for your wheat today, would you sell all your wheat? About uh, a third of the hands went up. Yes. Well, wasn't that the cost of production plus a fair profit? Yeah, we think it would be. Well, why wouldn't you sell it? Some of them said we'd have some taxes to pay. What the hell do you think this nation runs on? <laughs> we have a gentleman from North Dakota here. Montana. I don't, I don't know his name. I know his name and I can't call it. The senator? John Melcher. Will you stand, John? John's one of the men that you asked every year to please, please give you the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And John tries. He comes from a Montana state where wheat is supreme. Locally, it's politically expedient for him to talk like that. But he has 99 more senators in Washington, D.C. that mainly come from urban areas. And we'll say that a New York senator has to go back to New York and say to Mrs. Shavinsky, I'm sorry, Mrs. Shavinsky, but I just had to increase your taxes this year because the poor farmers out west aren't getting enough for their commodity. Do you know what he just did? He just committed career suicide. <laughs> I'm not blowing smoke on him. I'm just telling you the problems you heap on his back because you absolutely are determined not to develop your own marketing system like every other business does and go into the market and price your product and come home with a profit in your hip. The only thing that the United States government has ever given anybody in that, in that relationship is a, is, is a minimum wage situation and that's exactly what you have today in your farm program. And that's all you're ever going to get. Quit whistling in the dark. You have the most powerful commodity in the world in your hands. You hold it first, and you will not work with your neighbor. You know, we were going to do something this morning, but we got kind of thrown off track. Mm, this afternoon, we will. We were going to give you numbers when you came in the door, one and two. And we were going to, after you got in here and sat down, we were going to tell you why. You're going to be all mixed up. We are going to take uh, the 
people and put them together. We're going to put all the twos over here and all the ones over here. And then we were going to tell you that you know where your salvation is? It's that with guys sitting in front of you and behind you and on each side of you. For God's sake, turn around and shake hands with him and get acquainted. Because he's your salvation. That's what we're going to do. Anything wrong with that? You see, we got some things to learn to do. This procurement system that the grain structure has had to, had to produce to guarantee them an abundance any place, any time they need it is not easy for them to operate. It's a very ticklish thing. The minute they pay you too much, they don't get any grain. Yes. 